Okay, hello. <clears throat> we'll start the session again uh, after after your generous response for the first session. I am actually overwhelmed and <laughs> under a lot of pressure to add more value today. So I put together a certain set of topics which I think again can fetch two three questions. Um, and let's let's get started with that. Let's play IFT 2017 GK Dutiye Part Two. All right. So <clears throat> just to begin with i will take m and a mergers and acquisitions in your mind answer the question what's the difference between a merger and an acquisition right <coughs> you answered it so mergers is when uh, merger is like two equals coming together to form a third entity an acquisition is when a takes over b completely all the all the shares have been uh, taken over by another entity uh, <coughs> you may be confused by the interchangeability of these two terms the point is that since acquisition has a negative connotation and therefore you know just to uh, make the employees of the acquired company feel good many a time merger is used in place of acquisition but it, the technical difference is uh, <clears throat> when two companies yield a, another a third company it's called a merger uh, legally speaking and acquisition is a completely consuming b Yeah, right, so the the <clears throat> the smaller merger uh, mergers and acquisitions which come from India and are important just because it's an Indian examination. Otherwise, nobody would. Uh, Flipkart acquired eBay India. I've just taken the last let's say a, a year and a half uh, to come up with this. So eBay India was acquired by uh, Flipkart. Free Charge has been acquired by Axis Bank with great difficulty. Actually, Free Charge was on the block. you use the term on the block when when you want to sell a company uh, for a long time because it was owned by snapdeal snapdeal of course the legal entity is called jasper infotech they wanted to sell free charge for a long time finally axis bank agreed to acquire free charge um, jasper infotech had acquired free charge for around 460 million dollar and, and they sold free charge for just 60 million dollar and they were happy about it uh, that's how <clears throat> the current situation of snapdeal is and right, the big one is vodafone idea merger uh, which has happened as a result of reliance jio just dis disrupting everything in indian telecom market uh, the two are coming together to form what would be the biggest uh, uh, telecom entity telecom service provider in india and uh, there are still certain regulatory approvals to be done however this has been achieved so vodafone and idea will will be merging together so again this is a merger which means uh, and and birla will be the chair chair person of of the merge entity but this is uh, more like they 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 exchanging shares and coming together to so this google acquired halli labs is is hardly uh, something which we would have noticed uh, except for the fact that this was google's acquisition of an indian company it's a bangalore based based company and uh, nobody actually knows what it does um it, they say they are into artificial intelligence but the point is that if you know artificial intelligence raise your hand what is actually is artificial intelligence <clears throat> right so everybody says artificial intelligence is like my favorite uh, joke but nobody actually knows what is artificial intelligence but these people do artificial intelligence google acquired halli labs it was an acqui hire so basically they they were acquiring the people behind the company of course google was, was not interested in what halli labs Uh, we were doing they were just a four month old company when they were acquired so it was an acquisition for the talent not for uh, the business uh, airtel acquired telenor india <coughs> this happened i think uh, more than more than a year ago uh, again this is consolidation in in indian telecom space after the reliance jio making waves there so they, they are now coming together to so basically indian telecom space is, is now moving towards uh, and oligopoly which means just three four players would would have most of the market share 80 90% market share will belong to just three four players which in any way is there happening happening and the fear is that it may become a monopoly which means just one player will call the shots in the telecom market and and jio is obviously aggressively tar targeting that <coughs> okay this one came before <laughs> they were uh, i'll come to sbi but before that sony has acquired 10 sports from z so right so z has sold off 10 sports to uh, sony this is this is already established it's done sealed 
um, you see there are two things one is when when it is uh, uh, announced and the other is when it is completed which means all the legal formalities have been completed all the approvals have been taken from the so that entity and this answers the question what is the entity which looks into all these mega mergers they, they provide they approve or disapprove <coughs> it's the competition commission of india ICCI competition commission of india established in 2002 uh, by an act of the parliament so they look into these mega mergers and and they only look uh, from the point of view of whether uh, they are moving towards a monopoly whether they will have uh, the power to de determine prices in the market if that is the case they would most likely not approve right so all, all those have to be taken care of so announcing an acquisition and completing there's usually a lag of a few years between the two now uh, havels acquired lloyd electric and engineering known mostly for their air conditioning <coughs> right, so and havels is now trying to diversify into most of consumer electrics and el electronics and so this was their move to do that this is an old acquisition now uh, quicker acquired common floor so uh, still just for the sake of it mintra acquired jabba an old acquisition old would mean uh, close to two years ago scl technologies acquired geometric solutions uh, another one in tech space in india uh, the big one is ongc acquired is set to acquire and oil and natural gas corporation of india and hpcl the oil uh, distribution entity they are coming together now so ongc is acquiring hpcl uh, for i think 33000 close to 33000 crores uh, now this is a very creative way for the government to raise raise money it, it makes sense obviously the, the bigger the see the oil oil the, these oil firms the bigger they are the better it is for them to uh, get a good share of the world market but aside from that this is just one way by which the government is is uh, getting money because the government is the owner of these two firms the majority owner so what is happening is government is asking ongc to buy the shares of hpcl and that money will come to the government as as the owner so 33000 crore will be used to uh, will will count as as the revenue of the government i think it's supposed to complete by december of this year Reliance Communications had announced last year that it is, it is acquiring Aircel, but now they have cancelled it. In uh, I think two months ago, and you 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 uh, would have read it on Napoli. Uh, we we covered this this issue in there, but it was cancelled, and it was not clear why they had cancelled. They just said there are there are vested interests which are preventing us from uh, you know, completing this acquisition. Reliance Communication is going through a terrible time right, right now. Uh, so there's no no way out for them. They are mostly about to uh, default on their loan uh, obligations. And the big uh, public sector bank uh, acquisition, uh, which anyway everybody knew is is going to happen, uh, was that of SBI acquiring its five associate banks. So State Bank of India had uh, seven associate banks till till a decade ago, and the associate banks were those who were in the uh, set up in the princely, princely states of India. They all were called state bank, and when when India became independent and the princely states became part of India, uh, state bank became the uh, governing authority on these other state banks, but they they existed independently. Two of them, uh, I think, state bank of Saurashtra and state bank of Gujarat, uh, they were merged. They were they were merged with the SBI state bank of India close to a decade ago, and now finally these five. Travancore, Bikaner and Jaipur, Hyderabad, Mysore and Patiala, they have been also <coughs> acquired by, um, merged with the State Bank uh, of India. And uh, the other bank which has been acquired by the State Bank, the assets of which have been acquired uh, is, is Bharatiya Mahila Bank, which was set up in, I think in 2013. That was a time when the... Uh, women uh, movement was at, at its peak in india after that nirbhaya case so the government somehow thought this is one way to make people happy and this bank made little sense no sense at all actually why should you have a bank um, where you said mostly women will work and mostly women will get loans everybody will actually uh, put their m money in the bank and the point was that sbi anyway had women's only branches more than 100 women's only branches and the asset size of those banks were much, much more than what Bharatiya Mahila Bank could have uh, acquired. So it did not make a lot of progress. It made sense to merge it with SBI, which will continue with its women's only branches. 
right? So these five uh, associate banks. So Bharti Mela Bank was not an associate bank, and the other five, Travancore, Bikaner, Jaipur, Hyderabad, Mysore, and Patiala were the associate banks. And they got merged, and BMB got merged with SBI. Usha Anand Subramanian was the chairperson and MD of Bharti Mela Bank. No longer the case because there is no Bharti Mela Bank now. Uh, so yeah, then that is the outcome here. And now the big ones, the global uh, M and A's. Um, again, the last I, I have not put a limit to this. Last three four years, uh, M and A's are here. The biggest ones in the in the last three four years. So Dupont and Dow Chemicals came together to form uh, Dow Dupont Inc., uh, which is the world's largest chemical firm right now. And uh, so, so this is a merger. Both the companies merged to form a third third entity. You would know Dow Chemicals for their association with uh, an event whose anniversary happens today on the second of December, <coughs> and that the Popal gas tragedy. Union Carbide was owned by Dow Chemicals later after after the Bhopal Bhopal tragedy. And for that, Dow Chemicals had to face a lot of protest. 2012, uh, in the London Olympics, uh, they were the sponsors, and many activists, global activists, had a campaign against uh, Dow Chemicals sponsoring uh, the Olympics. Right. So, in any case, the business is good. Doesn't matter. <coughs> yeah, I missed this one. Verizon uh, Communication and Verizon Wireless. Uh, this was a huge deal. 130. These are all 100 billion dollar plus plus deals. So Verizon Communications acquired Verizon Wireless. Now it's an acquisition because uh, Verizon Wireless was a separate entity. Initially they were with the Verizon Group, and 45% of Verizon Wireless was owned by Vodafone. So in a sense, Verizon uh, Communication bought the 45% stake for 130 billion dollar from from Vodafone. Vodafone had to do this because it was it, it is going through a tough time uh, in in managing its business so <clears throat> this was one of the biggest and then you have an heiser bosch uh, acquiring sab miller uh, right you would know this even if you know don't know this most likely you have consumed the, the brands that are associated with with these brands these are all into alcohol these are into alcohol alcoholic beverages <clears throat> and uh, again a huge ac acquisition more than I think again close to close to 130 uh, billion dollar. All these top three are, are close to close to that figure. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> again, consolidation is happening in alcoholic beverages too. Now, AT&T Time Warner is again one of the biggest acquisitions of our time, recent times. The point is that you now they have hit a regulatory roadblock after Donald Trump came to power because Time Warner owns one channel which Donald Trump you know, really, really, really hates. Which channel is that? Uh, CNN. Right? So Donald Trump, according to him, CNN is all fake news. And to be fair to him, if you have ever watched, at any time you switch on CNN, you will find them cursing their president. So they truly do that. In fact, they spent close to a week debating if Donald Trump is a moron or, or is he a bloody moron that's what they were debating because it was rumored that the secretary of state rex tillerson had said that you know, the president is a moron of course tillerson is about to be fired in, in a week or so on twitter right so this is at and in time warner so so donald trump has put regulatory hurdles here they won't let cnn get money from at and basically time warner there now heinz and Kraft they merged to form Kraft heinz company uh, this is owned by Berkshire Hath Hathaway, uh, which of course is is Warren Buffett's investment company. So one of the biggest business moves of Warren Buffett is to uh, you know, acquire these two companies and merge them into, to put these two companies together and, and form Kraft Heinz uh, company, which is owned owned totally by, uh, not only the majority stake is with, with Berkshire Hathaway of uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, if you get time after your exams, you should watch any documentary, there are many documentaries on Warren Buffett on YouTube, you'll probably get a fair idea of what his investment philosophy is, which is actually very simple. Uh, yeah, in 2009, similar to AT&T acquiring Time Warner, 
one deal was Comcast acquired NBC Universal. So basically, distribution companies acquiring content companies. Uh, that that is is the flavor in the international media space. So in 2009, Comcast had acquired NBC Universal. AT&T wants to do the same with Time Warner. Now this is <coughs> Linde acquiring Praxair. Sorry, merger. Linde's merger with uh, Praxair is uh, all about gas because they are into industrial gas manuf manufacturing. And they are the biggest players. I think Linde was, uh, is, is the largest and Praxair was the third largest. Of course, put together, they still remain the largest industrial gas company in the world. So <clears throat> that is one. And then we have Charter Communications acquiring Time Warner Cable. Not to be confused with Time Warner. It's a separate company from Time Warner. It, they are into cable, cable business. And Charter Communications is also into that. So Charter Communications, whose brand name is they work under the brand, brand name of Spectrum. They acquire Time Time Warner Cable. Activist Allergan is a pharma um, acquisition. Activist acquired Aller Allergan. A very interesting story uh, behind that. Allergan was in no mood to be acquired, but there is a term called hostile takeover in, in business, which means you don't want to be acquired, but I will anyway acquire you. How will I do that? You are a company, of course. <clears throat> How will I do that? I will, and it's easier to do for a listed company. Uh, more than half of your shares are in the market. I will make offers to all the shareholders and I'll, I'll buy their shares. The moment I acquire more than 50% uh, of the shares, I become I become the owner of the company. So that is called hostile takeover. So Allergan, Allergan was being pursued by uh, a company, I'm forgetting the name, I think, uh, Valiant, yeah. Allergan was being pursued by uh, Valiant at that time and they were buying all the shares of Allergan and Activist was approached by Allergan to, uh, because Activist was more amenable, more suitable for their business unlike Valiant which would have uh, you know, tampered their business. So Allergan approached Activist to, to, to be acquired and, that, and, and the deal was done before they could be acquired by, uh, by Valiant. Uh, and this 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 whole thing is called it's called white knight uh, in your strategy management in b school you will come across this term called a white knight so a white knight is an, a company which saves another company from being acquired in a hostile takeover so we uh, so anyway these are interesting uh, topics to be uh, to be read and be happy about and uh, yeah, so that was about it. So white knight is one, <coughs> one term. I mean, I'm not sure if it's relevant, but white knight is one. Hostile takeover is another one. White knights prevent a hostile takeover. Those who do hostile takeovers are also called black knights, and uh, any other term. So yeah, we can move. And the best example of this actually was uh, the acquisition of uh, Porsche, the automobile brand by um, <coughs> Volkswagen. Volkswagen acquired Porsche in around 2008, I think 2007, 7, 8. And the point was that Porsche had moved to acquire Volkswagen. It was Porsche which had started buying shares of Volkswagen and they had bought, I think they had moved towards a majority share. But in that process, they had borrowed so much that their business became unviable. And then Volkswagen, in a very surprising move, Volkswagen bought Porsche. And in a way, Porsche was happy because their loans were you know, un unviable at, at that time. So, yeah, so Porsche became owned by, came to be owned by Volkswagen. And another term there is Pac-Man defense. It's in M&A, it's called Pac-Man Pac defense. So basically, again, maybe I'm distracting, but it's interesting to know. So what will you do? These are all valid probably for your interview questions. Uh, now company B wants to acquire company A in a hostile takeover. What can company A, A do to prevent that? Hey, what can you do? You can uh, Company A can ensure that the share price starts increasing. The moment the share start, price starts increasing, it will become increasingly expensive for, for the, the hostile, the black knight to acquire, acquire a company. So you can release some information to the public that we may be acquired. That itself will push the uh, mark, uh, cost of acquisition really high. Hey, so Pac-Man defense is not... In any case, let's come to Shell. So Royal Dutch Shell, or what we know as Shell, they acquired the British oil major BG, BG Group. CVS Health, it's a merger of healthcare giants, CV, sorry, acquisition of Aetna, a healthcare uh, provider um, with CVS Health. 
and this Dell EMC Corporation, I think it remains the biggest tech acquisition ever for close to 70 billion dollars. Dell acquired EMC EMC Corporation with this merger has uh, this acquisition has been completed now. Another big one is Bayer acquiring Monsanto for close to the same amount, close to 70 70 billion dollar. Bayer acquires Monsanto. Now Monsanto is a very profitable big giant in the chemical space fertilizer space the the big reason why it would want to be acquired is is that it has earned its, its name is associated with trouble as when greenpeace has nothing else to do they go and protest against monsanto anywhere monsanto can make any random announcement even if they say we are going to do charity you will find greenpeace activists protesting outside their office that how can you do charity you kill people through your fertilizers and pesticides Right, so it, it makes sense. So Bayer requires Monsanto. Monsanto will lose its name. There will be no Monsanto. So they will start protesting against Bayer. That is one. Now, <coughs> uh, I should have put actually that question there. But those who smoke can figure that out. Who owns which brand of cigarettes? Most likely, you are not smoking any of those uh, any of the cigarettes owned by these people. Right? You you like ITC Indian company. So <coughs> British American Tobacco acquired Reynolds American that owns rj reynolds tobacco company and this is a big um, merger uh, acquisition in in the tobacco space again a huge 60 close to 60 billion dollar uh, worth of uh, money was paid by bat to uh, reynolds american basically rj reynolds tobacco company at and acquired direct tv which is a pay paper use tv uh, business at and this, this is three years three years ago and this is the latest one Qualcomm acquired, this happened this year, NXP Semiconductors. Uh, a Qual now Qualcomm is, is a controversial company because uh, it, it uses its patents to make the cost of, uh, basically on your, your calls will be much cheap, cheaper if Qualcomm were to not charge royalty on its patents which are, which are effectively for simple uh, no, uh, things they do in there, in the chips. So, in any case, uh, and Qualcomm is fighting a, a huge legal battle with Apple regarding royalty payments. Apple slashed their uh, royalty payments and they, are, they, are, they filed a case. Apple has filed a, co a counter case that that is going on. But yeah, they acquired NXP semiconductors. Chem China acquires, uh, acquired Syngenta. This, uh, this was completed this year. This acquisition has been completed. The chemical giant from China, Chem China acquired Syngenta which uh, is one of the biggest chemical firms so Chinese state firms are now shopping across the world looking for big players which are struggling financially and they are they are uh, taking stakes in those players again a big uh, acquisition this year is Agrium acquiring Potash Corporation uh, they are into the manufacture of Potash Potash related products uh, into fertil which are used in fertilizers and other chemicals uh, huge ac acquisition close to 40 billion dollar Sounds boring, but uh, you know this is actually big, a big business, and there, and there exists a monopoly here. Sorry, no, not monopoly, ol oligopoly. A few firms are controlling the market. So, Agrium acquires Potash Corp. Not completed again because um, many governments have to see if uh, their regulatory bodies have to approve the deal. And they will look into whether pricing power will will in increase as a result of this. SoftBank acquired ARM Holdings. And this happened, I think, in 2016, early 2016, or around that time. And you know that SoftBank is the is the biggest investor. <coughs> oh, okay, who's the uh, founder and CEO of SoftBank? Uh, you come across his no name almost every other day because he's also investing a lot in in India in Indian Indian companies. Uh, Maya Maya Shohi Som. Maya Soi Shom is, is, is the uh, founder. It's a Japanese company and it's not a bank at all. It's, it's just an, an uh, investment firm which is now everywhere. Microsoft acquired LinkedIn for a huge sum of $26 billion. It seemed like uh, they overpaid for it, but the growth of LinkedIn is such that, and it, again, it's a monopoly in its field. There's no other player which, which is comparable to LinkedIn. Uh, so they paid 26 billion dollar for for LinkedIn this you must be knowing already <clears throat> I, I decided to come on LinkedIn just two weeks back because people told me it's not Facebook and so I said okay let's try I hate I, I don't know if I hate or I'm scared of Facebook but I'm not there 
एनीवे सो एम एन ए ग्लोबल टू अमेजन अक्वायर्ड होल फूड्स a very strange acquisition because amazon is 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 the one which is killing a session answer the question who is the ceo of hp enterprises uh, meg whitman meg whitman is one of the most uh, famous uh, women ceos of for, no, of any fortune 5 country uh, company and she has resigned recently she will remain in power till uh, till february of this year and she has uh, anyway let's not get into the restructuring you can just search for meg whitman on napoli and you can come across her her, her philosophy so nimble storage was acquired by hp and workflow an app management system was acquired by apple google acquired kaggle into data analytics i believe and uh, intel acquired mobile i mobile i is an israeli company which are into driverless technology I, as you know this driverless technology is supposedly the future of automobile uh, but it has run through a lot of hurdles these days because of uh, a few accidents happening in the trial runs and also because of a lot of ip related issues patent wars are happening in 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 this right which reminds uh, me i should have uh, uber owns a company <coughs> which uh, uh, which is in, uh, which uh, is contesting a lawsuit against google right you have to i am not answering this i know the answer why not answering this you look up for this right after the session i'll put that in the slide don't worry and another big one 46 billion dollar worth of money was paid by luxottica to azilor these are into luxury luxury eyewear uh, one of the biggest acquisitions of this year and both european firms and again historically the biggest ever acquisition uh, remains that of manesman by vodafone uh, they acquired this uh, company manesman in 1999 at 202 billion dollar a huge huge sum right now adjusted for inflation it would be close to 290 billion dollar so that is the biggest ever acquisition and then you have aol acquiring time warner one of the best examples of of one of the worst acquisitions is aol time warner they just totally overpaid for this the business went for a toss and again as you saw previously time warner is again is, is on the block it 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 is to be sold now and donald trump is not letting that happen uh, so pfizer again pfizer has been on an acquisition spree for a long time now warner lambert Pfizer acquired Warner Lambert in 1999 for 112 billion dollar. The biggest acquisitions in the state-owned space, government companies, of course, is they are from China. So, Shenhua Group and Guardian Corporation they have come together this year to form China Energy Investment Corporation. Uh, again, it's it's like ONGC and HPCL uh, coming together, but of course, when China does it, it's at a huge scale. Uh, so this total worth is 278 billion dollar for the shenhua group and guardian corporation coming together to form china energy investment corporation the second one also is that of china china, china min metals acquired china metallurgical group in 2015 for so these all uh, these these firms coming together to form a huge firm again because if the uh, you are into energy or metals or commodity the bigger you are the better it is for you to acquire a higher global stake so it makes sense to make these changes there right so this was about mergers and acquisitions i have tried to cover most of them i hope they don't come up with any silly uh, one which i have missed now books and authors difficult to predict uh, what can be asked so we just go by some logic to uh, to this uh, 2017 man booker i told you in the last session who is the winner of 2017 booker and what's the name of the book i hope you remember it even if you don't remember it don't worry you recognize it when you see it in the options so the short list for 2017 man booker uh, it had these six books the winner of course was lincoln in the bardo by george saunders an american author the last year also it was won by an american author paul pt uh, and since it is only since 2013 that man booker have allowed 
countries writers from outside the commonwealth to uh, apply for uh, apply for bookers for for booker award so these are the books which have which were shortlisted 4321 is by paul oster history of wolves by emily fredland exit west by mohsin hamid uk pakistan uh, author elmet by fiona mosley and autumn by ali smith uh, these these are the other five shortlisted books uh, certainly if you if you are into reading books these are the books you must read um, i know what the next book you will read will only be to answer the question in that question in interview what is the last book you read and i can also predict the books which you will be reading but let's not get there but if you are really interested these are the books you should be reading and now before a short list there is a long list released by uh, the booker co committee so these books were in the long list of course they include these six books the 10 11 books were there in, in in the long list and the one which probably you should focus most on is from our own arundhati roy our own again depends many many people say they are not our own she's not our own but the ministry of utmost happiness is 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 her book uh, it was in the long list it was supposed to be a very strong candidate to win the booker but it did not did not make it to, to the short list right and this is her book this book comes after her last book which was the god of small things which actually won the booker and i think that may have worked against her uh, this times uh, and yeah so that so that's about so i don't know for uh, from booker lincoln in the bardo by george saunders ministry of utmost happiness arundhati roy and the others you will have to probably memorize uh, because you are not familiar with uh, with these and booker is by the way given for unlike uh, nobel prize in literature which is given for a lifetime's work booker is given for an individual book so you may may be a first time author and you write an excellent book you can win win a booker for for that so that way you can target a booker prize if you are into writing um, again so i thought let's look at the best sellers uh, i just looked at the barnes and bn and barnes and noble list and amazon list of best sellers uh, these are the books which made the cut uh, obama and intimate portrait is is the best seller on every platform one of the top 5 his biography has been written by pete souza so the biography of obama right 50 shades darker is what donald trump would call a really bad 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 book uh, but it makes it to the top of all the best sellers <laughs> so el james is has written this bad book uh, of course before that it was 50 shades of gray and now it's 50 shades darker we can predict the next name uh, <clears throat> the getaway which is a, a book for children by jeff kinney uh, that that is the third third i'm talking about this is barnes and noble's list of bnn list of best best sellers uh, wonder is by rj palacio origin by dan brown you would have read his book surely um, i think is 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 one of the favorite authors with indian students um, so yeah origin is his latest book good night stories for rebel girls i really like this name uh, good night stories for rebel girls by elena elena fevelli and francesca cavallo and it's just one page they have written about it is it's they, they call it a uh, fictionalized uh, biography of the girls who, who have mattered uh, and um, it's so yeah it's, it's in the best seller book leonardo da vinci Uh, his biography by Walter Isaacson is in the list of the best sellers. Leonardo da Vinci, as you know, is probably uh, you know there is more myth associated with him than than facts. And his painting recently again, <coughs> you know, broke a world record. Um, I think you can find more about about it in 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 Napoli. That won't be asked. Don't worry because anyway, this it happened recently, two weeks ago. now grant by ron shernow is a uh, is a fascinating book it's 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 based on on the life of ulysses grant the president of the united states one of the supposedly one of the worst presidents of the united states so this book has tried to redeem his 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 reputation uh, the book is called grant the rooster bar is by again john grisham a, a popular uh, writer 
The Wisdom of Sunday is by Oprah Winfrey. Again, one of the most powerful women ever in any list. And her book is The Wisdom of Sunday. Turtles All the Way Down is by John Green. A fascinating man. And you should, if you are interested in world history, you should just watch his world history series of uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, so he somehow manages to do a lot of things. He writes bestsellers and he creates so, those wonderful videos for, for YouTube. And, and The Fault with Our Stars is, is, is his book, which was made into a, a movie which was successful even commercially. And that was his last book. So now he's written Turtles All the Way Down. The Sun and Her Flowers is somehow in the bestseller list, in most of the lists. It comes from Rupi Kaur, who is uh, a Canadian citizen, of course, of Indian origin. She is a Canadian citizen and she is heavily criticized for, uh, for her casual way of writing and for her, uh, I don't know how to put it, she is very sleazy in her writing and she is apparently the first Instagram author, Insta author. She started by putting various quotes, quotes on Instagram and then start, she started publishing books. And her books sell a lot. The Sun, the Sun and Flowers has already sold more than a million copies. So that is what the subtle art of not giving a but you <coughs> that the certain I would have said it actually. The subtle art of not giving a F star CK is by Mark Manson. I like the name. I don't know how the book is. Giraffes can't dance by Giles Andre. The Handmaid's Tale is by Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood was supposed to be a strong contender for winning the Nobel Prize in Literature this this year. She did not, but it's only a matter of time. Maybe the next year or so, she will uh, win the Nobel Prize in Literature, which the, which in 2017 was won by Ishiguro, whose books are there in the I have mentioned in the last last, last session. So the Handmaid's Maid's Tale is by Margaret Atwood. Promise Me Dad is by Joe Biden, the previous Vice President of the United States. Uh, I don't know why would he write a book, he did nothing. The vice president of the United States did do, do nothing other than saying that they agree with, with the president. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, business books are probably uh, the ones which are more interesting and from where we can probably, we can hope to get a, uh, get a question. The first one, Nudge, Misbehaving. These are not, not the same book. These are two books. Nudge and Mis Misbehaving, they are from Richard Taylor, who has won the Nobel Prize in Economics this year. So his books are Nudge and Misbehaving. And he has won, as I said in the last session, he has, he has won it for uh, his theories, what his critics would say, so-called theories in behavioral finance. So more into psychological aspects of uh, making decision, making financial and economic decisions. Um, in nudge, he just says that everybody needs a nudge. It's not actually very. Uh, the government should give a nudge so that people behave in a certain manner. If the government incentivizes a behavior, people will do it. Sometimes people don't do what what makes economic sense. The government needs to give a nudge to make them act in that way. Richard Taylor was celebrated by uh, the government of India when he approved of demonetization in the last year and but he had also added a, a few caveats a few uh, warnings to that that the government did not focus on uh, and so he's popular with the indian government now in the next one thinking fast and slow uh, is from an associated associate of richard taylor daniel kahneman and daniel kahneman won won the nobel prize in economics in 2002 Again, for 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 behavioral finance, but he, that was not called behavioral finance at the at the time in 2002. It was mostly into uh, some decision making based on psychology. So thinking fast and slow is is from Daniel Kahneman, and the third book I have mentioned here is, is also related to to these these people who are into behavioral finance, the Undoing Project, a friendship that changed our minds. Uh, of course, uh, mostly if the question comes, it will just be called the Undoing Project. It's by Michael Lewis, who, who and the book is based on Daniel Kahneman and and uh, and his team, who were working on this theory that you know markets are actually not efficient. So what is meant by an efficient with this efficient market theory is that if the government does not regulate, if the buyers and sellers are left on their own. Uh, the ideal outcome will be automatically achieved by, by the market. 
and these people don't believe in that they, they think there's more to it than simple economic logic and that economic logic is that we are all rational and we take rational decisions and we, we act in our own interest it will be in the interest of the world right so this nudge and misbehaving i would say a strong contender for this year if they are rational they would put this now thinking fast and slow uh, was in news it published in 2016 again because of of the nobel prize in economics by daniel kahneman the undoing project is about the work done by these people by michael lewis who was previously written moneyball the big shot and flash boys um, so this group actually doesn't like the fact that you know markets are supposed to be efficient they go into all these tragedies that have happened to the financial world like the 2007-8 financial crash i i do what i do is by raghuram rajan Uh, which is a good name but then again i also do what i do and you also do what you do and we don't do what we don't do so he did what he did and he was liked by a lot except for the government and then he had to move now is again pursuing academic on the monetary policy right i actually since i follow monetary policy i think subhar rao got less credit than he deserved because raghuram rajan had the fortune of joining at the time when the economic conditions were improving and this ubar aw was in charge of the five during during the five years where india india was undergoing a turmoil just hold on yes. yeah. okay yeah we'll resume now what did i lose so again i'm not sure how much i have been lost out on on this some 20 30 second disruption so i do what i do is by raghuram rajan Uh, <clears throat> i cracked a good joke i not repeat the joke in case that has been recorded so you will think i repeat my jokes so what who moved my interest rate is by d subarao who was the governor of rpi before raghuram rajan and he had to take a lot of tough decisions he fall, fell out of favor uh, with the government just because the governments actually i'll cover the you know, monetary policy towards the end of it but typically the governments would want the interest rates to be low because that that gives a boost to business and the economy but the rbi governors their first job is to control inflation so if inflation is high the interest rate has to be high and uh, subara was in charge of the economy at the time when the inflation rate was actually in the, the double digits right now it's 3 to 4% so it's it's, it's comfortable in a way as right? so a current current governor is governor is urjit patel won't be asked surely uh so the other books are elon musk the biography on elon musk yeah so elon musk is by far the uh, i think let us say <coughs> he's the next steve jobs these just people don't say they are inspired by steve jobs they say they are inspired by elon musk and most of the people who say they will not be able to name five businesses where, where musk is interested in or or is invested in and they would they would say that he actually founded tesla motors but he did not found uh, he was not the founder he, he took it up uh, took it over from from others in any case so elon musk is the book we should read ashley by ashley vance and next one is by our own satya nadella that book is called hit hit refresh by satya nadella so again an important one because it's from our own satya nadella uh, again now uh, bujia barens is the story of haldirams it's by a female journalist and author uh, pavitra kumar supposedly a very interesting book but a very thick book just when i looked at the thickness i said no way i'm going to read the story of haldirams uh, but yeah so bujia barens is the story of haldirams so started from selling literally vending it on the streets to becoming a 5000 crore empire global empire the everything store it talks about jeff bezos the founder of amazon the everything store is by brad stone and the book became more famous when uh, uh, mrs bezos his wife i think mackenzie bezos she gave she gave the book a one star rating on amazon itself this book was being sold on amazon itself so she gave the book a one star rating and she she wrote a lengthy review on why she doesn't like a lot of things written here and and certain factual errors mentioned there so then this book became more famous havels the untold story of kimat rai gupta right so this book has been authored by anil rai gupta now kimat rai gupta was the founder of havels he passed away in 2014 you wouldn't have heard of him because he was he not into the media he was building the company and he did a great job at it i think havels is about to touch a billion dollar uh, net worth now 
and uh, so this this book is written by his son Anil Rai Gupta, who is who is who is the CEO now, CEO of Havels now, and uh, supposedly a very good take on 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 Kimat Rai Gupta. So by the way, uh, how anybody knows why is it called Havels? Yeah, it's all that if you thought it's not an Indian company because the name doesn't sound Indian. It's it's called Havels. So this Havels comes from Haveli Ram. One person called Haveli Ram, Haveli Ram was the founder of of Havels, and Kimat Rai Gupta was just a distributor of electrical you know, equipment manufactured by Haveli Ram. And then he he, he just converted this to a uh, an anglicized name. It became Havels, and now it's actually going to be a global. It's it's, it's actually a global success story now. Right now. For some reason, K P Singh decided to write uh, a book on the success story of D L F. When D L F is actually not none of the real estate companies are doing very well. In any case, it's a good story he, with his military background. He he, um, <clears throat> the full form of D L F. I think is uh, Delhi Land and Finance Company. D L F stands for that. So whatever the odds is is the story of K P Singh, the founder of D L F. Nana Lal Kidwai again frequently cited as one of the most inspirational women business leaders of India. She wrote a book which she could have titled better, but I think it's just called "30 Women in Power: Their Voices, Their Stories" by Nana Lal Kidwai. She was associated with as she is known for building HSBC into a uh, powerful business in India. I guess was Kony Capitalism and the Ambani's. Amb Came two two years ago. It's, uh, it's a good book written by these analysts, Pranjay Guha Thakurta, an excellent analyst, uh, analyst uh, who you will not find regularly on mainstream channels. He mostly comes from uh, on the government channels doing analysis. So Bir Ghosh and Jyotirmay Chaudhary. So gas wars us are related to. Of course, you can understand this gas wars wars related to what the wars between between uh, Reliance Industries and the government over how much royalty is due. Uh, this relates to the Godavari, uh, Krishna Godavari uh, Basin, uh, where the the dispute is around the discovery of oil that uh, Reliance Industries Limited underreported that and therefore underpaid the government's share of royalty. While uh, Mukesh Ambani says uh, the production was not as as was expected. How Google works is by the co-founder of Google. Eric Smith and his long time associate in Google Jonathan Rosenberg Lean in again I would say an important book Lean in is by Sheryl Sandberg the first female employee and the CEO COO of of Facebook Sheryl Sandberg's book is Lean in the lean startup I just put here because this book comes up frequently on how startups should behave and the lean startup is gradually becoming a movement that even the startups you know, they should remain lean from from their very beginning is is by Eric Rice. Dream with your eyes open is by Ronnie Scruvala, who, you, as you would know, is um, uh, the founder of UTV Group, media group, media company. Right. So this is uh, about business uh, books. Again, I would just say Richard Taylor, Nudge Best Behaving, uh, Sarah Sandberg, Lean In, Satya Nadella, Hit Refresh. Probably this. Uh, book on Elon Musk uh, that 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 is that may be important, but in any case, I have not put a lot of these. So better better read this and 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 go quickly. Heads of organizations, uh, not sure if they ask, but if they ask, it will be a sin to not not answer it. Uh, the reason they don't ask a lot of it, they have asked it in a few years, is because uh, by the time it is asked, it, uh, the leader may change. Still, chief economic advisor is Arvind Subramanian. Uh, these are he is the one who is responsible for the publication of the Economic Survey of India, and the latest of which uh, was released before the budget in, fe in February. Uh, so, Economic Survey of India covers all the economic developments of the last one year. So, 2016-17, all the developments were covered, and the way forward, all the analysis is, is done. Um, an extensive document. And I obviously cannot cover those points in in say in this session. Probably it's not even needed. Uh, but of course, when you go for an interview, it will be required for for you to become an expert on Indian economy so that you stand out in the crowd. Now, Central Vigilance Com Commissioner is K V Chaudhary, C V C. 
the vigilance top vigilance body of india chief information commissioner is radha krishna mathur sbi chairperson is so india has lost one uh, women leader uh, again it's actually disappointing as looking into the wiki page of indian women business leaders i thought there will be a lot to select from it just gets over and it is it's it's that reflects and in aptly we have covered this issue a lot of time that you know we, we can celebrate arundhati bhattacharya or nanalal kitbai but these are uh, very few women mostly that women empowerment has not been achieved on the grassroots and even in the senior managerial uh, position close only 7% of women are at the top most ma management in in india that won't be asked because that comes from a survey and there, so yeah so sbi chair chairperson is Rajneesh Kumar, he has succeeded Arun Dhati Bhatta Charya, who has led SBI, who led SBI really, really well. So now it's, it's Rajneesh Kumar. I would say it's an important, uh, important name to remember. Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister is a new body established, uh, which works under the purview of Niti Aayog, and the chairperson is Vivek Debroy. So this is uh, again. So Vivek Debra is let us say a pro-government economist. He is usually heading a lot of committees set up by the government, but uh, this very respectable person in uh, the field of policy. The Attorney General of India is K K Venu Gopal, appointed a few months ago in this year itself. Uh, Eighty year old, more than eighty year old, and still very active in in uh, in law. I think all these lawyers have a long life. All all these these famous lawyers. Look at our. He retired. Right, Jeet Malani, Matal, Jeet Malani retired only recently now, uh, more than ninety. So yeah, our Attorney General is K K K Venu Kapal. Chief Election Commissioner is Achal Kumar Jyoti. Uh, appointed a few months ago. The Comptroller and Auditor General of India C A G, uh, who is uh, who is the top state auditor of of India. Is Rajiv Maharshi. So the mandate of CAG is to conduct audits into all the state firms, and the firms, even the private firms, where the state firms are involved or they have invested. So there was a famous case uh, while in the in the same gas dispute, uh, that Ambani gas dispute. The Ambani sir, the Mukesh Ambani sir argument was that CAG cannot conduct an audit because the government wanted an audit done, but the Supreme Court decided that the CAG can conduct an audit because. the revenue of the government depends on 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 the data provided by ril so yeah so rajiv mercy is the cag of india right now cbi director is alok kumar verma uh, national security advisor is ajit kumar dohal supposedly one of the sharpest minds of indian police ever and he works behind the scenes to make things happen of course uh, not all that he does will will ever become public but a uh, a good strategist is is from indian police service ips chief of air staff is birendra singh dhanwa army staff is bipin rawat and naval naval staff is sunil lamba and so these are about uh, people heading various organizations in india and now again again we'll come to indian women leaders these are the ones we could find a few of these are actually you know they serve in in the uh, family companies family owned groups such as indu jain who who is the head of bennett coleman limited which owns the times of india and shobhna bhartiya who uh, owns who is the, who is the head of the hindustan times right hindu indu jain is bennett coleman times of india and shobhna bhartiya is hindustan times Kiran Majumdar Shah is uh, Biocon Limited. We all, I think, we we know. Indra Noi must be so bored bored of listening to people saying that she she is her inspiration, uh, <clears throat> but but she is. And inadvertently, if I ask you who is your favorite uh, women business leader, you would say Indra Noi because that's top of the mind recall that marketing concept, and there. Interestingly, I know tomorrow is your exam, but anyway, if if I could narrate, I was doing a mock interview for. Uh, I hope he's not attending the session. In any way, I'm not not naming him, and and I just asked who is your favorite women leader, recently for ISB Indian School of Business and mock interview. He said he said, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bini Bansal, and I was I was actually perplexed. I thought let me not show my ignorance, but I thought Bini Bansal is the male co-founder of Flipkart. And he said, "Mrs. Bini Bansal." So I, I, 
I asked him later that who is Mrs. Benny Mansell. Is it co-founder? Right. So that's how much we appreciate women leaders in India. I think so. Yeah. So Benny Mansell is not not Mrs. Benny Mansell. He is Mr. Benny Mansell, and uh, Sachin Mansell and Benny Mansell are not correlated uh, uh, by by blood. They were just friends who started Flipkart. And uh, let's come to the next one. Vandana Luthra is VLCC, an excellent business model. They are they have expanded into the Middle East, doing good business. Chanda Kocher again. If it's not Indra Nui, it would be Chand Chanda Kocher. Uh, she is with ICICI Bank. And uh, interestingly, so in the banks we see a lot of women uh, rising to the top. What is the reason? We don't. I think we can only guess, but probably it has to do with taking calculated risks. As I think in the NAP uh, published to, uh, a day ago, it was mentioned that they take risks. Women entrepreneurs, but they take calculated risks, unlike men who would just jump for glory. So maybe that's the reason. But Chanda Kocher, ICICI, Archana Bhargava, United Bank of India. Uh, right now, so yeah, Arshina Bhargava may be important. Uh, she is a recent appointment at the top of the United Bank of India. Chitra Ramkrishna is a former NSC CEO, National Stock Exchange CEO, <laughs> and uh, the current one is Vikram Limai. Chitra Ramkrishna is is in some trouble because of certain scam allegations, along with a few other top management members of 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 NSC, right? Uh, Renu Sud Karnad is HDFC. We are talking about the head, uh, as in the chairperson or MD or no. so. I'm not mentioning that, but Renu Sud Karnad is SDFC. Shikha Sharma, Axis Bank. Usa Sangwan again a recent appointment at the top of chairperson of LIC. Usa Sangwan is LIC. Vijay Lakshmi Iyer is Bank of India. Uh, Zarin Daruwala is CEO of Standard Chartered Bank of India. Not a chairperson, but CEO CEO of Standard Chartered India. Uh, Abanti Shankar Narayanan is DIGO India, uh, frequently cited among the most uh, influential business leaders of India, women. Sangeeta Pendurkar is Kellogg, Pri uh, Kellogg India. Shona <coughs> Chauhan Saruja is Parley Agro, not the chairperson, but uh, I think the CEO or on equivalent position. Vinita Bali again for a long time, Britannia. So Vinita Bali is another favorite. Uh, another excellent business person of India and Avni Sanglani Davda is Godrej Nature's Basket. Uh, Pita Reddy is Apollo Hospitals Group but again she comes from the family the Reddy's control the Apollo uh, Apollo Group. Roshni Nadar is HCL again she is the I think she is the adopted daughter of the founder Shiv Nadar of, of HCL. So these are the list of women uh, business leaders of of India uh, and uh, yeah so I think if one has, uh, usually I think that if there is a question it would be match the following so even if you get match two you can match the remaining remaining one uh, surely All right so this brings us to uh, what would be the final uh, section of uh, of the sessions on, on IFT I thought whether or not I should put the government schemes here but the point is that Narendra Modi has launched close to 100 schemes in the last last three years. Uh, and it's difficult to discuss them. And mostly you can judge which scheme is does what by the name itself. So if there's any doubt, just go by what the name means. Because the acronyms are, are cleverly crafted to reflect what, what they are into. For example, Ujala. Uj Ujala is a scheme which has to do with LED distribution, LED. Uh, so it's for low because LED distribution is supposed to bring in energy efficiency, boost in energy efficiency in, in the country. A, a controversial topic whether it does or not. But yeah, so so I'm not not discussing the government schemes. A huge list cannot be covered, and mostly you would know by their name themselves. This thought we should know about the Monetary Policy Committee. Now, when we say the RBI decides the interest rate. Uh, technically speaking, it's not the RBI, R RBI anymore. It's, it's the Monetary Policy Committee, which is a panel comprising of government representatives as well as uh, RBI representatives. So it is a six-member committee uh, <clears throat> where you have three members from the RBI and three members appointed by the government. Uh, and uh, the point is that the RBI has... has RBI rules this MPC 
because if there is a tie then the rbi governor will have the casting casting vote whatever the rbi governor says will be decided so the six member committee with rbi governor as the ex officio chairperson of the monetary policy committee and it is it meets four times a year is supposed to meet four times a year it can meet for more number of, of times if there are uh, tough times the economy is going through tough times it can meet for uh, more number of times but it has to meet at least four times in a year that is the next one i think is due this week is it the next week so the next week you will find find the next i think tuesday is when they announce so next tuesday you will find their next set of announcements now the point is their primary man mandate is Uh, what is called the anchor their anchor is that the inflation in india has to be 4 plus minus 2% that is their first mandate which means if this is achieved they will look into anything else uh, 4 plus minus 2 obviously means 2 plus uh, 2 to 6% right? preferably around 4 so that is their 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 mandate and uh, so why was this needed was because earlier there used to be a lot of controversy uh, there would be some randomness to this the rbi actually has has to take care of inflation but it also has to look into how to boost growth in in the country so sometimes rbi governors would decide to reduce interest rate even when the inflation was was not comfortable which was high and that used to lead to to some controversy so right now this is through established through the rbi act so rbi was set up in 1930 came into existence in 1935 but it was set up through the RBI act of 1934 uh, <clears throat> at that time so i mean the amendment has been made to the RBI act of 1934 to make sure that uh, they are bound by this uh, so yeah 4 plus minus 2% is what you should remember gdp growth rate the latest figures were announced two days ago 6.3% is the quarterly growth rate now i don't see it happening that they will ask in quarter 3 what was the growth rate right so in any case you see the trend was declining till this one so five consecutive quarters saw declining interest uh, declining gdp growth rate in, growth rate in india so bad bad times for the indian economy and now it it finally seems like acche din aane wale hain the good days will come quarter 2 it has gone up and many economists have actually said that in the next few quarters will be better than better than the previous one and the troubles in the economy came primarily because of uh, demonetization and the goods and services tax uh, now demonetization why because is uh, this is a cash driven economy so india is a cash driven economy and much of the cash is not in, in the white which means it's in the black people just use cash and when you curb that obviously there will be an impact on the businesses of various companies so that that impact was felt uh, but it went on for a, a longer duration of time than can be logically explained and then came gst on july 1 2017 goods and services tax was uh, implemented finally uh, a, a long legal process um, leg- legislative process was completed and that led to certain problems because the businesses were very cautious and there's a term called destocking uh, you uh, the explanation for the fall in gdp growth rate was especially in um, for the manufacturing companies their contribution was that the companies were destocking which meant that they were not uh, they were just getting rid of the old inter- inventories rather than building more inter- inventories which would mean increasing production that's because they were cautious in the first few months of of the gst implementation that has now changed so now even in apple we mentioned that one reason for the manufacturing sector doing better than expected is that the companies have started restocking so now they are building their inventory therefore there has been more production and i should tell because not many would remember or many would remember i hope so you read this in school uh, or in any course in economics you 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 read this what is gdp gross domestic product is the sum total of of the total uh, value of the goods and services produced within uh, the territory of a country in a fixed during a fixed period of time so uh, quarter or so when we say this 6.3% in quarter 2 it simply means that 
uh, <coughs> quarter one starts from April, right? April, May, June was quarter one. Quarter two is July, August, August September. July, August, September. So July, August, September, September of 2017 compared to July, August, September of 2016, there has been a growth of 6.3 percent. Yes, that is our GDP growth rate. It can become a very very technical session. GDP at market, uh, no. Uh, rate GDP at factor cost, all those terms are involved, but I don't see them asking such uh, such questions. Um, so basically, there is a term called real. When we say GDP at uh, uh, real price, it simply means you you dis you you remove the impact of inflation. You you discount inflation and then say what has what is the increase in the value. Because just just to explain it with one example, if the inflation rate this year was ten percent, so if the good was priced at hundred rupees the last year, this year automatic if even if nothing happens, it would become hundred ten hundred ten because of inflation, and it would show a growth rate of ten percent overall. Uh, that now that does not actually reflect true value generated in the economy. So when we say real, we remove the interest or the impact of. Inflation from uh, the same is is true for even interest rates. When you say real interest rate, you remove the impact of inflation. So if you are getting a let's say you are getting a an eight percent return on your fixed deposit, if it's eight percent return, the real return real interest rate will not be eight percent. You will have to remove uh, the annual inflation rate from that. So that would be around four percent because inflation has been around four percent in the last one year. As a GDP growth rate officially for 2016-17, the entire year was 7.1 percent. The entire year was 7.1 percent. This year it will be far lower than this. As you see, the graph came down. Now it has gone to 6.3. Maybe it will be 6.6 and 6.9 in the next quarter. Surely we are not going to touch 7 percent in 2017-18. But it will. The hope is that it will grow from from there. The target is uh, the dream target is to touch and cross 8 8 percent. Uh, growth rate all right so this is my old favorite uh, image which i keep using here and there uh, just because it looks cool it came in when Raghur Ramajan became the governor of reserve bank of uh, the reserve bank of india <coughs> so and this was a piece by shobhadeh i remember clearly uh, there was a lot of analysis on why he's good and shobhadeh said he finally we have a good looking governor here um, for the rbi so that's how the mean see the mean all the women of India by saying that now we have one reason to follow monetary policy. I, I took this image from there. It looks cool. Uh, yeah, so so the, these tools, again, you should know about this, the meaning of this. To get into the details is not possible uh, to, to do. I think it's not possible in the next 10-15 minutes, surely. So I'll just give you some idea about and don't worry about asking uh, them asking what is the repo rate right now. Because the repo rate, no, it, it, it would change there. Is, is that 6% or 6.25%? I don't think that can be a question. So we should understand first, what is the repo rate? Uh, so RBI, the lending starts from, from the Reserve Bank of India, the entire process of lending. And they don't give the money for free. So repo rate is the interest rate that they charge from, from the commercial banks. When they give money to the commercial banks, then uh, the banks have to return that money at at this interest rate which is called repo repo stands for repurchase so they agree to uh, to be uh, to repurchase that right so that is the repo rate now one thing you should understand is that this is a, a short term liquidity measure right? it is mostly overnight so when we say uh, let's say 6% repo rate uh, it is for the year but they don't the banks don't hold it for a year it's mostly overnight they take it today and settle tomorrow uh, they are supposed to use this for meeting their short term you know mismatch as a asset and liability mis mismatch so they're supposed to use them for that and when we say short short run it's usually the maximum limit is for 14 days so there are certain uh, provisions called term repos term repos trm uh, they are for 7 day term repo or 14 day term repo, surely not beyond 15 days, it cannot be more than a fortnight. That simply means that the banks can keep that money and, and return after 7 days or 
14 days the annual interest rate for that is that but the other calculations follow so that is repo rate and then of course you have the reverse repo rate but the banks can also park their money with 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 the rbi now if they do uh, they will get paid for that money right and that 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 date of interest is called the reverse repo rate uh, so if they have extra surplus money remaining and there are no no takers people are not borrowing which actually is the case uh, the term technically is called credit offtake credit offtake so credit offtake in india has not been good and uh, so indian gdp uh, the entire method of calculating in, in, in GD, the gdp of india has undergone an overall in the last 3 years it was a statistical exercise a lot of revisions were made in, in the method and the baskets of goods and services that they measured was expanded the sources of data that they take uh, they have changed earlier they, they would do surveys to find out the prices now they take take the data from uh, mca 21 uh, that that's ministry of consumer affairs called sorry ministry of corporate affairs they have a database called mca 21 where the companies are supposed to enter their details so a lot of changes were made as a result of those changes which we found that the indian gdp actually increased at that time itself the gdp two years ago it revised by 0.5 percent it got a boost so a lot of criticism criticism around that and you find these there are terms called indicate leading indicators leading and la leading and lagging indicators but mostly you come across this term called leading indicators so what is a leading indicator which indicates beforehand how the economy will behave in the coming coming quarters so credit offtake is one one leading indicator which simply means that if people are borrowing more they will buy more in the coming quarters so the economy will benefit and the companies are borrowing more they will they will be investing and producing more in the coming quarters right so the credit offtake is not good now so the banks would want to park their money with the rbi and get some interest on that since there are no other takers so, so they get paid at this so reverse report is always less than repo repo rate it makes perfect sense because otherwise if you were a bank what would you do you would borrow borrow from the rbi and immediately give to the rbi and make money on that it is so it's quite logical that reverse repo has to be less than than the repo rate uh, you it used to be around one percent it used to be fixed at at one percent uh, now it's at 0.5 percent less than less than repo rate it can change from time to time it again depends on the monetary policy committee now what what to do but surely it has to be less than the repo rate the other term you should know is cash reserve ratio so basically banks suffer from a lot of risks uh, one is there's a term called run on the banks uh, run on the banks uh, a few years ago many years ago right right now i think uh, there used to be long queues we are not talking about demonetization because in demonetization there was an immediate restriction placed people cannot withdraw why was that restriction placed because otherwise immediately people would have panicked and they would have done something with their with their any panic and people start withdrawing money uh, from the bank so there used to be long queues outside icic bank atms because a lot of smss said that as icic bank is about to collapse it made no sense at all and people started withdrawing withdrawing money so that situation is called run on the bank when the banks do not have enough money to pay to the people who have given money if you we who have deposited money there to prevent that from happening rbi the reserve bank of india every central bank in the world but in india the reserve bank they have two mechanisms the first one is called cash reserve ratio which means that a certain percentage of uh, the bank's funds they have to be parked uh, necessarily with in the form of cash with the reserve bank of india and in this regard there is this term called you can see on the screen net demand and time liabilities ndtl and now what is an ndtl see the liabilities, the liabilities are of two two types demand liabilities and time liabilities demand liability would be uh, your your uh, your salary account or any from any account from where you can go and withdraw you withdraw from the atm because that's a demand liability anytime you demand the banks are obligated to pay to you time liabilities are fixed so your, the fixed uh, deposit would be a time liability it's only going to 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 be available to you after after a certain period of time so whatever is the total liability and dtl 4% of that has to be parked as cash with 4% can change but usually they don't tinker a lot with the crr 
uh, has with the RBI. Now the point is, the banks don't get any interest rate on any interest on CR. Hey, so in reverse, we saw in reverse repo. So banks are paid at the rate of reverse repo, but not for CRR. Whatever they deposit above CRR is on what on on on, on the amount on which they will be is the amount on which they will be paid the reverse repo rate. For CRR, they won't be paid. Why is it with the RBI? Because otherwise, what what would banks do? See, what banks have to make money. So whatever money they get from the people, they would want to give us loans and and, and make money. Unless there there is an, a, a legal obligation, they won't be interested in blocking that mon money with with them. So CRR keeps the money off of them, cash off them, four percent of that, which means highly liquid. Anytime they need, it will become av available to them. The next one is the statutory liquidity ratio (SLR). A similar mechanism. The point is that this is uh, with the banks themselves. So it's not necessarily uh, not not not. not not even necessarily. They have to be uh, necessarily blocked with the banks, not not with the not with the RBI. That is called SLR. And now the point is here. Here the, the rules are are liberal. It need not be only cash. It can be cash or other assets allowed by by the Reserve Bank of India. And, and mostly these are investments in this this. So let us say I am not too sure how much is it right, right now. Somewhere around 20, 21 percent, maybe 20.5 percent is SL, SLR right now. Statutory liquidity ratio, which which means that this is around 20 percent of NDTL is to be necessarily blocked with the banks themselves in the form of cash or other uh, liquid assets allowed by the by the RBI. So gold is also supposed to be a liquid asset, and state government. Central government, state government, basically government bonds, securities, they are also supposed to be liquid. Liquid simply means that when you want to sell, you sell and you, you, and you get your money back. Right? So that is there. So this, interestingly, this SLR is, is one reason why uh, the government of India, and which is not, not good at all. But the point is most of these are domestic debts where you have uh, <coughs> just, just one second. Right, so anyway, I was telling I'm like now, okay. So, so SLR is just surprised they would ask it, but they did. Right, so anyway, now the uh, 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 not a new term anymore, but this this uh, this was introduced in 2012 marginal standing facility MSF. Now, why is this marginal standing facility needed? Now, we know about repo rates that the banks can borrow. Uh, from the RBI uh, for their overnight requirements or up to 7 or 14, 14 days. And the point is there is an upper limit to, to what how much they can borrow. Each bank has an upper limit and overall the banking system has an upper limit. Uh, so the banks cannot go beyond that upper limit. Uh, limit That again is a function of their NDTL, the certain percentage of that. Uh, only they can borrow. In case they need more, in case, in case they need more than that, then they have to pay a higher interest rate. That interest rate is marginal standing facility, which means it will be made available to them. They will have to pay what is right now fixed at one percent more. They will have to pay one percent more than uh, more than that, uh, more than the repo rate. Uh, now, why is it one percent more? Because they do not do not want to encourage banks to have these imbalances, and one percent matters a lot with one percent. Uh, the NIM net interest ma margin. So basically, for the banks, they don't talk about profitability and prof or profits. They talk about net interest margin. Is their equivalent for 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 that? And now, if they pay one percent more on 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 these funds, they will have to their NIM will suffer. In regardless of this, this is made available because uh, certain crises will demand uh, this facility. Right, so overall, these are called uh, this come under liquidity adjustment facility. So what we were discussing just now, they fall under liquidity adjustment facility. They are used to uh, adjust the day-to-day -day mismatches in liquidity. That simply means asset and liabilities. Uh, so basically, banks know tomorrow how much will become due, and they do not have enough money to take care of that. So what they will do is they will borrow from the from the RBI using these these facilities. 
<coughs> right so repo reverse repo we know LAF was introduced in 2000 uh, not certainly not important there now CRR versus SLR difference we know both are reserves and uh, again I think I have talked about about these uh, so CRR has to be maintained in cash while SLR has to be maintained in cash or other liquid assets that RBI des designates banks do not get any return from CRR that cash with, with, with the RBI but banks will get returns from SLR why because they invest they put the money in the government securities and they get paid uh, in return of that the government securities that is why most of the SLR actually is in government securities why would they just block their cash that cash can be used to give a, to be given us to be to give us loans so they, they invest in government securities and earn, earn some interest on on that so this is about our liquidity adjustment facility i put one uh, note here uh, slide here but the point is bank rate is simply the long term borrowing rate for a bank compared to msf msf is again for short term uh, it is for short term liquidity if the banks have to borrow let's say for a month or more than a month for close to a year they will have to pay at this rate which is called bank rate usually 1% more than more than uh, the repo rate which means msf and bank rate they are uh, usually the same rates uh, the difference is msf is for the short run and bank rate is for the long run uh, by the way uh, uh, the longer the duration of a loan the greater is the risk Right, so risk is, of, uh, is directly proportional to time the, for which the amount is invested. So it simply means that for bank rates, there uh, there will be more stringent provisions than than there would be for for MSF. Beyond that, I don't think we need to know this. This is uh, sort of what is called the corridor of liquidity. Now this is just for uh, this is an older. Uh, now this X plus hundred. Okay, by by the way, so BPS is basis points. So when these uh, RBI people they talk about interest rates, they don't say uh, in percentage. They say basis points. So if on Tuesday let us say we find that our, although the RBI monetary policy committee is supposed to not do anything at all, just wait and watch. But let us say if they, if they reduce the interest rate by twenty five uh, by zero point two five percent, they will say twenty five basis points that it, it changed by 25 basis points so 100 basis points is one percentage that is your bpps right so what you call an LAF framework is so there's an upper limit to it which is uh, through the margin standing facility the lower limit is reverse repo in the middle you have repo rate uh, rate that is your the so-called corridor of liquidity now also uh, there's a term called open market operations OMO, OMO. So it's not that you know uh, a bank needs the money and the bank will get the money just by making a phone call. The RBI conducts auctions, so they have to bid for that. So when we say there's a repo rate, let us say repo, the repo rate is six, maybe six point zero five percent, six point one percent. That depends on the bidding process among the banks. They'll bid for it. Why will they bid for it? Because like I said, there's a limited amount to be given. So that decides. So repo rate is where it is expected to land, but usually it fluctuates. That's why you see that wave, wave there. So overall, so this is your uh, corridor of liquidity. This is mostly your uh, liquidity monetary policy. All that you need to know, and um, only technical questions, as in so-called technical. See the thing about technical is people say this is very technical. I don't know technical. And the point about the technical is what you don't know, you will say it's technical. What you know is not technical. So there is nothing technical about it, just common sense. You just no need to know what uh, repo, reverse repo, uh, CRR, SLR, MSF, uh, liquidity adjustment framework, open market operations. These are the only terms which you think, uh, which, which you should know about. And of course, the monetary policy uh, committee, the constitution of it, the target is 4 plus minus 2 percent and i think so that should cover most of what can be asked now quickly uh, just some logic about uh, if they have to ask a good question they may they they, they can ask uh, what does one what, what happens when so <coughs> before that so 
what happens when the interest rates go high right if the interest rates are higher people will borrow less the companies will borrow less uh, so if, if the overall economy borrows borrows less what will happen to the demand situation demand will fall right so if the demand will fall then the price should come down that is the reason why interest rates are are raised and uh, there if you are familiar with economy we are talking about the demand curve shifting to the left if you are not familiar with 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 economics and then leave it but in any case this is just logical raise the interest rate people and companies borrow less therefore the demand comes down and therefore price falls that is why the banks uh, the reserve bank of india would want to raise the interest rate there hey right? so that is called dear money when you say a dear money policy it means Uh, focusing on increasing the interest rate dear money policy would be followed at least in india only when in inflation rates are going high right now it's at 4.36% uh, if it crosses 5% it moves towards we know the upper limit is 6% you would find interest rate going up so that would be a dear money policy or the so called hawkish h a w k i s h hawkish policy uh, it comes from hawks so hawks what do they do they bounce Uh, on on this, so the, the target is to control inflation. They raise interest rates, right? So again, all these are logical there. So what? So let's say if you have to only change the CRR or the SLR to fight inflation, inflation is going up. What would you do? Would you increase or decrease them? You would increase them. Why? Because that will block more money of the banks. More money will be blocked. If more money is blocked, then less money will be available to be given as as loans. Hi. Right, so again, open market operations. So selling securities and buying securities. So when when RBI sells securities, it it absorbs money. Right. So if selling securities simply means or selling paper, it's called uh, RBI will sell paper securities, which simply means it is absorbing money. So banks will be given some interest rate on that, and it's absorbing money from from the banks. Buying security means pumping money. So in in uh, the European Central Bank, for example. uh they have been pumping i think 80 billion euros close to 80 billion euros since the last many months which simply means they are buying buying securities worth that and giving that much money to the economy why are they doing that the biggest worry there is that uh they may become deflated that is the inflation uh, infl- inflation will become negative uh, that is that situation is called def- deflation now deflation is even even worse than inflation because if if the economy is deflated the prices are falling consumers will be happy but the businesses will shut shop why would they be producing in an economy where the prices are continuously falling and there will be a lot of job losses so no country would want to have a deflated economy japan for long has been uh, deflated and the, the inflation goes up up to 1 1% and then again again falls down so japan is uh, that is what went wrong with japan regardless so that's the meaning of buying securities or buying bonds giving money to money to the to the economy right so we know what to do with the interest rate If inflation is high you increase the interest rate increase the repo rate reverse repo rate will automatically get will be increased because it is linked the marginal standing facility again is linked to the repo rate so uh, it, it will move accordingly so cheap money is uh, when the interest rate comes down then you say money has become cheaper so you will borrow more you will buy buy what you wanted to buy and you and you were delaying you were waiting for the interest rate to fall it's also also called dovish dovish for policy from dov d o v e so this is cheap money is the dovish policy and now it's used to to fight deflation in, in with regards to if, if, like i said if the prices are falling going to the towards the negative territory for example in india if the in uh, inflation so by the way uh, inflation when we say inflation in india talking about consumer price index cpi cpi based inflation earlier uh, the rbi used to consider wholesale price index wpi but since 2011 it has been considering consumer price index which means you measure the prices at the consumer level not at the wholesale level which was in the case of wholesale price price index so if you know the lower limit is 2% if it approaches 2% we will find rbi reducing interest rate by quite a quite a lot so that people start buying and then there's a demand boost to the economy and right and now you can understand that again crr will be decreased slr will be decreased 
any of these will be used that that will that will be happening so that is about your uh, infl inflation and and interest interest rates in, in increasing moving towards towards 60 uh, dollar per barrel so that that will complicate the life for uh, for, for us other trade treaties and all we have uh, discussed i think i mentioned rc rcep uh, <coughs> regional comprehensive economic partnership which is being driven by china all these things are there so if you're not watched the previous session i think at least you get the slides and, and you we so we received uh, hundreds of mails uh, we delivered the email with it i think it reached to you it took longer than we thought it, it would in that in such a case you just had to go to our url there and you could have downloaded the ppt so you have not seen the previous session you you surely go through through those slides there so we come to the end of it and i thought i'll put a slide on the celebrities who have passed away but just too many celebrities across the world have passed away so we'll only give our tribute to the one whose loss was mourned by more people than um, for any other celebrity right so if you know this you shouldn't be knowing this actually but if you know this is hugh hefner the founder of playboy <coughs> the founder of playboy and the, and the playboy himself he passed away <coughs> So yeah, Hugh and Hefner, Playboy. Maybe that can be asked. I'm not just just put it here for 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 cracking a joke, but I thought this might be the only one which can be uh, asked. Otherwise, the celebrity list is huge. 2017 is is a celebrity killer in that sense. All right. So um, yeah, this 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 concludes the session. Like I said, we have the government schemes. I have not put. There are just too many. It would have taken. Uh, more than more than an hour to explain explain those but just go by the names that's that's what thankfully Narendra Modi has done you, you can guess it by the name what you think it is that that's what exactly what it is so don't listen, miss miss those questions just because you have never seen those schemes just see what think what they must be doing that is one and the others will come randomly from current affairs again let me conclude this by saying that if if so this is a quick fix I hope it works even if it doesn't I know, at least we have tried our best. Uh, the point is, don't don't do this to yourself. If uh, you have to stand out in your GD interview, those those GD not many institutes do uh, GDs these days. But in a one-on-one -on -one interview, you should just be regular with news. Of course, I will recommend Napoli. Uh, many of you are happy with it, but follow any news if if you have to regularly. Uh, and I I don't see that. And and please don't wait for that to be over for. Uh, that to be over for uh, doing that and uh, we received a few mails asking for that decision making session on on that um, i think next saturday we will i'll just do one session on on, on decision making so to basically demystify decision making and let you know that it's just and uh, what you think on a day to day basis is is what will get you the answer for decision making in that all right so with that we come to the i was outside the screen all the time so anyway <coughs> so um, so yes we so this is the end of uh, this second session and the final session uh, so the quick note i've already already mentioned you have an exam to take also this is a general general tip for the exam examination one or two people asked ask, asked me uh, my only advice is to maximize your reasonable attempts. There's no other way to get a really good percentile in such a complicated scenario. Just maximize your reasonable. By a reasonable attempt, I mean, and I'm not just talking, talking about GK. In GK, if you don't know how to, how will you? Uh, <coughs> if you can guess probably, but even in other sections, just uh, you have read the question and then you have taken an informed decision. That should be your approach to maximize the attempts or IFT or CAT or that or or any other examination and just don't worry don't be nervous in this examination or any examination <clears throat> once you decide uh, to get married or to do mba it inevitably happens so it, it will happen what it what happens after that becomes more important for that we will have another round of discussion there so yes thank you thank you for all the great feedback overwhelming puts me under a lot of pressure but good to know that you like the sessions I am not a good man. I am not going to end this with this person on the on the on the screen. So thank you. Yeah. So the slides.